When it comes to construction projects, it's common for our minds and eyes to drift towards the finished product. Whether it be on paper or during construction, it's only natural to think about what it's going to take to physically build that house, bridge, building, or other structure. We could say the same for small renovation or maintenance projects as well. What if I told you that building the physical end product is only part of what goes into a successful construction project? As a matter of fact, there are numerous other factors that are integral to the success of a job site which often go unnoticed. Let's refer to them as job site logistics. Logistics on a job site are what allow crews to work, for equipment to operate, and for material to be on hand during construction. Whether you're planning a project from scratch or are planning to start one soon, making sure you have these logistical aspects covered is essential for a successful outcome. With that in mind, this video will hopefully be helpful for both professionals in construction, such as a project manager, engineer, or architect, as well as those looking to take on a project of their own. My name is Patrick, and in this video, we'll be talking about several key logistical aspects of any job site, which will give you a broad overview of the basic topics you'll need to know. I'll be presenting these topics in roughly the same sequence that they'll appear in a project's life cycle. And before we begin, I'd like to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, OSHA Campus by 360 Training. If you need to complete an OSHA 10 or 30 hour training course and wish to do so online, 360 Training offers flexible, affordable, 100% online training options that you can access from any device on your schedule. Check out the pinned comment below for more information or to enroll today. If you sign up using our link, we may receive a small commission which goes towards helping the channel grow. Your support is always appreciated. Now, let's dive into today's topic. The first step in planning any construction project is figuring out how the area of work will be accessed. Building a large warehouse in a rural area, for example, might require a temporary road just to get to the job site. Accessing a work area on the roof of a high-rise building, on the other hand, requires ladders, elevators, specialty equipment, and so on. Regardless of which type of project you'll be doing, anticipating how labor, equipment, and materials will physically get to the area of work is a must, which will allow you to plan and budget accordingly. Now that we've figured out the access portion, we need to consider how we'll secure the job site and protect the public along with those who will be near the area of work. Job site security and protection has two main purposes, to keep people nearby safe and to prevent illegal entry, which, let's be honest, means to prevent theft, at least most of the time. In terms of preventing illegal entry, many larger job sites will have a temporary fence installed around it with locking gates both of which discourage individuals from entering the area or stealing tools and materials. These fences often feature a mesh screen or even plywood sheeting to keep flying dust, loose debris, and materials from flying all over the place. Other ways of protecting the public include overhead protection along sidewalks, safety signage, temporary plywood divider walls, detour routes for traffic, and many more. These are just a few examples. I've even been involved with projects in New York City that feature guards, turnstiles, and card key access just to get into the job site. And if you're interested in learning more about job site safety, I'll put a link in the description below to a video I made about 12 essential job site safety topics. Now that we've thought about job site access and securing the work area, we're ready to move on to a field office. A field office can be a portable trailer, space inside the building we're working on, a rented space near the job site, or if you're really lucky, your car. I've worked in field offices before that were inside old grocery stores, inside a rented apartment, inside an old doctor's office, and even inside a building where tombstones were made. The main purpose for a field office is to give superintendents and project managers space for desks, computers, phones, printers, and all that good stuff. They're also critical for hosting meetings, storing drawings, if there's enough room left for- Your robots in here? So many activities! So be it. At this stage in the project, we've figured out site access, security, and a field office. But how will workers actually do work? Where will they plug in their tools? How will they get light or water? How? Will the coffee machine run? This is where temporary utilities come into play. In order for a job site to run successfully, there needs to be a source of electricity and water on site. This may be as simple as power outlets and a hose bib if working inside an existing building. In more remote areas, we may need a potable water truck and generators to get our power. On a large enough project, we may have to establish new water and electricity services that will go on to service the finished building when the work is done. It's important to consider the amount of power and water that will be needed to facilitate the work, as the existing services may need to be modified in order to do so. <laughs> or 
they may simply not be enough in the first place, which means we'll have to have provisions for power and water ourselves. All of this is very important for budgeting and planning purposes. Every project known to man involves three key ingredients, labor, equipment, and materials. And when the day is done, workers go home, assuming they aren't passing out on the field office floor. But what do we do with equipment and materials? For a small project that'll only take a day, this isn't an issue. Work crews will just take back with them whatever they brought. When it comes to larger and longer term projects, we need to think about where equipment will be stored when not in use, as well as where stored material will be staged before it's needed. This can take the form of what's known as a laydown area, which is either a portion of the site or an area near the site that's dedicated specifically to storing larger pieces of equipment along with building materials in a strategic manner. Locked storage containers are often used to store expensive tools and materials as well, which serve as protection from both weather and theft. Smaller job sites may not have the space for a laydown area though. In these cases, we must strategically make space using things like lockable rolling toolboxes and storing equipment like trucks, cement mixers, and man lifts in a driveway or even the street, which will probably require special permits from the town or department of transportation. In dense urban areas, laydown and storage space is often created inside the base levels of the building under construction, which can be annoying, frankly, as every subcontractor is on top of one another and there's a constant need to move stuff around. At least when we anticipate this, we can plan and budget accordingly. Now before we move on to the next category, I'd like to take a moment to mention that I offer one-on-one -on -one virtual mentorship sessions. Whether you're just starting out in project management and you're looking for guidance, or you're an experienced PM wanting to talk about a situation or project you're involved with, I'm available for both 30 and 60 minute virtual sessions. To learn more or to book a session today, check out the link in the description below. Now once we have the logistical items we've covered so far in place, the actual construction can finally begin. Now we discussed the importance of having storage space on site for materials, but what happens when a truckload of bricks gets delivered, or 250 bags of concrete, or 100 pieces of 2x6 lumber? How do these materials get from the back of a truck to the third floor of a new building, or to the 32nd floor of an existing building? I call this concept the critical material path, which is to say, the exact path the material must travel from the moment it gets unloaded to its final destination. Moving material along this path requires having the right amount of workers on hand, along with the proper equipment for doing so. Oftentimes, a larger site will have a forklift and an operator on hand to unload materials and move it around the site. This can include a telehandler type of forklift to help boom material up to a high point in the job site, such as a higher level in the building, which can be extremely helpful for bridge construction, high-rise construction, or building other tall structures like that. In tighter spaces or along paths where larger equipment can't pass, equipment such as a pallet jack or an A-frame cart are essential for moving several hundred pounds of materials manually. In an absolute worst case scenario, depending on the site you're on, material will need to be handled piece by piece. Regardless of how we handle the material, we're in a good spot if we consider the labor and equipment that'll be required to handle these materials and the logistics that come with it. And this also allows us to, you guessed it, plan and budget accordingly. So what is temporary protection in construction? In a broad sense of the word, temporary protection involves protecting existing conditions on a work site from getting damaged while a work is taking place. Temporary protection can involve placing thick paper or cardboard along hallways inside of a building such as a library or hospital if we'll be bringing materials and equipment through certain areas while the building is still operational. Temporary protection can involve putting similar materials down on countertops if we're working above them. It can involve putting plastic on floors, over windows, and over doors in order to contain sawdust and other debris. The same can be said about covering vents, appliances, machinery, or other mechanical equipment. I could go on and on with more examples, but the rule of thumb is to think about anything that could get damaged while you're doing your work and figure out a way to prevent it from happening, especially before a project ever starts. Speaking of debris, it's very important to understand that construction is a dirty business. Even small home maintenance projects can create lots of debris and leftover waste material. Perhaps you've experienced the joys of this yourself. I sure have. Temporary protection is great for the reasons we described, but it still leaves us with dealing with the waste. On a huge job site, we might need to remove 10 dump trucks worth of soil, or concrete debris from a 50 by 50 foot section of a bridge deck, or 20 wheelbarrows full of carpet scraps. What the heck do we do with all this? Just as we plan for the labor and equipment we'll need to move materials, we must do so in reverse when it comes to handling debris. That's to say, we must consider the path that debris will take from its original location all the way to the curb, dumpster, truck, etc. Of course, we must also think of the labor and equipment required to move it. Among the reasons that a good debris removal strategy is important is figuring out the costs that'll be involved for moving as well as disposing of it. Renting even a single 30-yard dumpster 
which is approximately 22 feet long by 7 feet wide, can cost a couple thousand dollars alone once it's hauled away and disposed of, depending on the type of material that's in there and how much it weighs. When a project involves getting rid of several dumpsters worth of debris, the cost adds up very quickly. I've got to be honest with you, I've saved the best for last. One of the, if not the, single most important factor we need to consider for temporary logistics on our job site Depending on the work site, we must either establish a bathroom in the existing building we're working in, or rent temporary bathrooms for our site, also known as porta johns. What do you think construction work is holding in all day? You know, here's a little business model for you, Mr. New York Fancy Pants. They sh I rake it in. Cha ching. Porta johns are perhaps the perfect exemplar of a necessary evil. Nobody really wants to use them, but everyone's thankful to have one if the need arises. And hey. If the Sharpie writings inside Porta Johns I've seen in New York City are any indication, there are a number of poets among us in society, regaling us with their humor, wisdom, and creative wordplay anonymously. If you made it to this point in the video, I'd love if you wrote the word Sharpie in the comments below to show your love and appreciation for Porta John poets everywhere. And that wraps up our discussion on the basics of job site logistics. I know I went through some of those a little quick, but I wanted to give a broad overview of several topics in a relatively short amount of time. Now, what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed today's video, liking it and sharing it with someone you think would enjoy it too would be a big help to the channel. And if you haven't, please consider subscribing to stay in touch for future videos. I'd love to see you around here again, and your support does not go unnoticed. And last but not least, be sure to check out the link in the description below if you're interested in virtual one-on-one -on -one mentorship sessions with yours truly. Thanks again for watching. This is PM Problem signing off, and until next time, cheers.